Um, so, uh, we were supposed to have a union organizer from the Central Labor Council. Uh, I'm sure he's just been busy and wasn't able to make it. He was gracious enough to come to the U of U RSU last night, and so we, those of us who made it were very appreciative of that. So I'm going to talk in his stead. What is a union? Uh, why do we need them? And how to get them? A union is above all collective bargaining. What it is, is when, work, uh, when workers get together and make demands together, rather than alone. It's very easy to understand. Uh, most of you here either have a job or have had a job at some point. So, uh, when you go ask your boss for time off or for a raise, for the vast majority of you, you know exactly what to expect. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. There is no reason except for the charity of your boss or the charity of the owner for you to expect any sort of raise, any sort of benefits, or anything of that variety. If you're absolutely fortunate, you'll work in a high demand industry where you have the possibility of leaving your job for another job uh, that maybe pays slightly better or has slightly better benefits, or use that as a threat against your boss to get what you want. There's another way to ask your boss what uh, your boss or your owner for improvements, either better benefits, better safety, better time off. And that is to get together with all the other workers at the place and make, rather than an individual bargain or an individual contract with your boss, to make a collective bargain. Uh, what collective bargaining means does not mean that everybody gets paid the exact same amount. It doesn't mean everyone gets the same amount of benefits. It doesn't mean everyone gets the same amount of vacation. What it means is that there is a contract as a framework for every worker to get a fair amount of benefits and a fair amount of uh, wage. So this is the essence of collective bargaining. It, there are complex legal and political and economic structures, but at the end of the day, uh, Collective bargaining comes down to getting together with your coworkers and demanding a better workplace. So that is, at its core, what a union is. However, there are a whole host of uh, legal restrictions that I'll get into on how to get a union that affect unionization here in the United States. Now, the other question is, why do we need a union? Now, it's Quite simple, when you ask a loan, you are basically depending on the charity of whoever you are asking. You are depending on the charity or the uh, positive feelings of your boss towards you, or you're depending on the owner. Uh, if they don't want to give it to you, they don't have to. Um, and not just they don't have to in some like abstract sense, but literally you have very little leverage to force them, short of doing a bad job consciously at work, or quitting. However, these are very unappealing options because it's relatively easy, uh, barring certain sorts of nuclear physicists um, or certain sort of other positions, then it's uh, absolutely impossible uh, to exert much pressure because you can be replaced. So, how does collective bargaining change this? Well, if you think about a factory, they could probably replace a single uh, metal worker who is unhappy. They could probably replace a group of friends um, who are unhappy and have, are sick of some manager. But to replace every single position on the floor all at once, is an incredibly difficult task. At its basic level, the union is the only real leverage workers have at their workplace to make any sort of demands. Well, how, how does this sort of lead off? Well, if you look just 200 years ago at, say, a uh, coal mine, um, you would see naked women and children, because they're smaller and can into the cracks, working 16-hour days, digging often by hand coal out of coal mines. That's 200 years ago. 100 years ago, 
in uh, coal mines, you would see incredibly dangerous, rickety structures uh, with outdated and dilapidated equipment. Um, the worst forms of safety, uh, constant accidents, collapsed uh, tunnels, um, mining explosions, um, and for example, if you've heard the phrase, uh, the canary in the mine shaft, as sort of an indicator, um, their form of chemical detection was literally to have a, chemi uh, a canary in a mine shaft. Um, for those of you who don't know, coal is a, uh, a, hydro a hydrocarbon, right? Well, there releases a lot of methane. And so as uh, miners dig further and further without proper ventilation, which was extraordinarily common, the methane that they released through their digging would begin to settle in the mine. And so you would have the case at any given year, hundreds, hundreds of coal miners would die in mine shafts from asphyxiation um, of methane. And literally the reason why you have the canary is the canary is smaller, has a smaller respiratory system. So by the time it died, you would realize that there was something wrong in the mine shaft and you could leave. And then hopefully, if you were lucky, um, you know, survive without serious without serious respiratory problems from that. If you look at mines today, even in the United States, they're still incredibly dangerous. They have lax safety standards, but there are at least safety inspections. Oftentimes they don't structure um, their mines correctly, and we have uh, tragedies like we had just this last year in West Virginia, and just two years ago in Southern Utah, and those are common, all too common. But without the union, there would be no uh, structures or regulations or safety procedures. It was the union that fought and literally died for it. Uh, literally, um, in the 20s, you have presidents calling out the National Guard to shoot down strikers. And literally, at one point, um, the Air Force was called in to strafe mines in Tennessee. That is a serious fight. And it's only because of fights like that that we have things such as safety regulations, um, the Occupational Safety and, uh, ha or, and Health Association, OSHA, that actually checks to see if workplaces are safe. If you have an eight hour workday, you owe that to the union. If you've ever been paid overtime, you owe that to the union. The fact that you got an education, most of you, uh, you got an education in the United States rather than working on a factory uh, where you had an incredibly, uh, incredibly high chance of being maimed or killed by machinery, you owe that to a union. If you grew up with health care that came from one of your parents' jobs, you owe that to a union. If your family uh, could afford to pay the bills because they got paid minimum wage, uh, which is again, not a fantastic wage, but the very act of minimum wage you can thank that to a union. So, historically, unions have got us where we are. Now, there's an argument that's frequently made, which is, well, you know, unions, unions were great and they were absolutely necessary back in the day, but we've got, you know, we've got health benefits. We, I mean, we've got this wonderful Obama health care program. So why do we need unions, right? We still have uh, safety inspectors, we still have we don't have any child labor laws. Well, one thing to keep in mind is these fight, or this fight and these gains are not universal and they're not eternal. We can just look at Wisconsin, that when the union movement and the unity between the union movement and the general population falter or weaken, the capitalists, the bosses and the owners will immediately move to destroy the unions. And they've done that. The removal of collective bargaining. Just as I said, collective bargaining is the fundamental basis of a union. That is where you can get together and demand things together as workers. That is under attack in one of the most union-friendly states that still exists in the United States. Um, you literally have Republicans, um, I believe it was Chaffins, who said that child labor laws are unconstitutional. Um, you have wages that have stagnated in the United States. Real wages, so real wages, 
not against inflation, but actual things you can buy, actual money you have to spend, have stagnated since the 1970s. And interestingly enough, you can see the stagnation of wages correlates quite nicely with the stagnation of union growth and union militancy. So those are the general reasons. Why specifically should you, at whatever place you work, want a union? Barring some exceptions, you do not get paid as much as you deserve. And I'm not even talking in a socialist sense that the capitalists are exploiting your labor. If you look at the books on just about any product, about any service, even with the bad economy, they pull in a lot more than they pay out. Um, and not only that, is you just have to look at the CEOs. Ford, right, you hear the story over and over again. Ford had, or the Ford went down because of the union. The union was paid too well. Well, the CEO made hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Got severance packages, uh, known as golden parachutes, where they ran the company into the ground for years after years, decade after decade, and they continued to be guaranteed, guaranteed funds uh, from Ford. The licensing for Ford Stadium, which is Detroit, right? Ford Stadium is $500 million so that Ford can call it Ford Stadium. How many workers' pensions could they pay for just by getting rid of the name of the stadium of a team, which I like, who is not very good? A lot. How many uh, factories could they have kept open if they would have just gotten rid of the name of that stadium? A lot. How many Americans could they have kept employed without that? A lot. And it's clear, it's clear from the bailout, right? The union was forced to buy more shares of Ford. of collective bargaining. 
It, there are complex legal and political and economic structures, but at the end of the day, uh, collective bargaining comes down to getting together with your coworkers and demanding a better workplace. So that is, at its core, what a union is. However, there are a whole host of uh, legal restrictions that I'll get into on how to get a union that affect unionization here in the United States. Now, the other question is, why do we need a union? Now, it's quite simple. When you ask a loan, you are basically depending on the charity of whoever you are asking. You are depending on the charity or the uh, positive feelings of your boss towards you, or you're depending on the owner. Uh, if they don't want to give it to you, they don't have to. Um, and not just they don't have to in some like abstract sense, but literally you have very little leverage to force them, short of doing a bad job consciously at work or quitting. However, these are very unappealing options because it's relatively easy, uh, barring certain sorts of nuclear physicists um, or certain sort of other positions then it's uh, absolutely impossible uh, to exert much pressure because you can be replaced. So, how does collective bargaining change this? Well, if you think about a factory, they could probably replace a single uh, metal worker who is unhappy. They could probably replace a group of friends um, who are unhappy and have, are sick of some manager. But to replace every single position on the floor all at once is an incredibly difficult task. At its basic level, the union is the only real leverage workers have at their workplace to make any sort of demands. Well, how, how does this sort of lead off? Well, if you look just 200 years ago at, say, a uh, coal mine, um, you would see naked women and children, because they're smaller and can easily fit into the cracks, working 16-hour days, digging often by hand coal out of coal mines. That's 200 years ago. 100 years ago in uh, coal mines, you would see incredibly dangerous, rickety structures uh, with outdated and dilapidated equipment. Um, the worst forms of safety, uh, constant accidents, collapsed uh, tunnels, um, mining explosions, um, and for example, if you've heard the phrase, uh, the canary in the mine shaft, as sort of an indicator, um, their form of chemical detection was literally to have a, chem uh, a canary in a mine shaft um, for those of you who don't know, coal is a, uh, a, hydro a hydrocarbon, right? Well, there releases a lot of methane. And so as uh, miners digged further and further without proper ventilation, which was extraordinarily common, the methane that they released through their digging would begin to settle in the mine. And so you would have the case at any given year, hundreds, hundreds of coal miners would die in mine shafts from asphyxiation. Um, of methane. And literally the reason why you have the canary is the canary is smaller, has a smaller respiratory system. So by the time it died, you would realize that there was something wrong in the mine shaft and you could leave. And then hopefully, if you were lucky, um, you know, survive without serious, without serious respiratory problems from that. If you look at mines today, even in the United States, they're still incredibly dangerous. They have lax safety standards. But there are at least safety inspections. Oftentimes they don't structure um, their minds correctly, and we have uh, tragedies like we had just this last year in West Virginia, and just two years ago in southern Utah, and those are common, all too common. But without the union, there would be no uh, structures or regulations or safety procedures. It was the union that fought and literally died for it. Uh, literally, um, in the 20s, you have presidents calling out the National Guard to shoot down strikers 
And literally at one point, um, the Air Force was called in to strafe mines in Tennessee. That is a serious fight. And it's only because of fights like that that we have things such as safety regulations, um, the Occupational Safety and, uh, ha and Health Association, OSHA, that actually checks to see if workplaces are safe. If you have an eight-hour workday, you owe that to the union. If you've ever been paid overtime, you owe that to the union. The fact that you got an education, most of you, uh, you got an education in the United States, rather than working on a factory uh, where you had an incredibly, uh, incredibly high chance of being maimed or killed by machinery, you owe that to a union. If you grew up with health care that came from one of your parents' jobs, you owe that to a union. If your family uh, could afford to pay the bills because they got paid minimum wage, uh, which is, again, not a fantastic wage, but the very act of minimum wage, you can thank that to a union. So, historically, unions have got us where we are. Now, there's an argument that's frequently made, which is, well, you know, unions, unions were great and they were absolutely necessary back in the day, but we've got, you know, we've got health benefits. I mean, we've got this wonderful Obama health care program. So why do we need unions? Right? We still have uh, safety inspectors, we still have, we don't have any child labor laws. Well, one thing to keep in mind is these fight, or this fight and these gains are not universal and they're not eternal. We can just look at Wisconsin, that when the union movement and the unity between the union movement and the general population falter or weaken, the capitalists, the bosses and the owners, will immediately move to destroy the unions. And they've done that. The removal of collective bargaining, just as I said, collective bargaining is the fundamental basis of a union. That is where you can get together and demand things together as workers. That is under attack in one of the most union-friendly states that still exists in the United States. Um, you literally have Republicans, um, I believe it was Chaffetz, who said that child labor laws are unconstitutional. Um, you have wages that have stagnated in the United States, real wages. So real wages, not against inflation, but actual things you can buy, actual money you have to spend, have stagnated since the 1970s. And interestingly enough, you can see the stagnation of wages correlates quite nicely with the stagnation of union growth and union militancy. So those are the general reasons. Why specifically should you, at whatever place you work, want a union? Barring some exceptions, you do not get paid as much as you deserve. And I'm not even talking in a socialist sense that the capitalists are exploiting your labor. If you look at the books on just about any product, about any service, even with the bad economy, they pull in a lot more than they pay out. Um, and not only that, is you just have to look at the CEOs. Ford, right, you hear the story over and over again. Ford had, or the Ford went down because of the union. The union was paid too well. Well, the CEO made hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Got severance packages, uh, known as golden parachutes, where they ran the company into the ground for years after years, decade after decade, and they continued to be guaranteed, guaranteed funds uh, from Ford. The licensing for Ford Stadium, which is Detroit, right? Ford Stadium is $500 million so that Ford can call it Ford Stadium. How many workers' pensions could they pay for just by getting rid of the name of the stadium of a team, which I like, who is not very good? A lot. How many uh, factories could they have kept open if they would have just gotten rid of the name of that stadium? A lot. 
How many Americans could they have kept employed without that? A lot. And it's clear, it's clear from the bailout, right? The union was forced to buy more shares of Ford. And the CEO and the corporate board were essentially allowed to stay in place. The government has no interest and no desire to protect workers. The only way to protect workers is through the union. At your work, the only way you're going to get better wages is through the union. The union is only, uh, one of the only ways to guarantee a pay structure that is either connected to the standard of living, which is something that a few unions have won, or that it adjusts over time. I, I work for Michael's Arts and Crafts. Their pay structure was you would get a raise once a year. If you were not there for a year, or you left and came back, you were no longer eligible for a raise. If you had a bad report, you were not eligible for a review, and you were not eligible for a further raise. If you um, complained about the wages, you very likely were not eligible for a raise. And these were working class families, many single mothers, and they made about $7 an hour. They now make, they, many of them now make more because minimum wage was increased. The wage, the, the big increase in money that you would get once a year, 10 cent wage increase. A 10 cent wage increase by Michael's Arts and Crafts does not cover the rate of inflation. The only way those people are ever getting a wage increase is through a union. And the simple fact of the matter is a union can demand regular three-month period reviews and regular three-month 10-cent wage increases. They would actually get people a standard of living that they could live with. Benefits. Most of us are now forced <coughs> to buy into the Obama health care plan. It's socialized insurance, which means the insurance companies still make money. They are still for-profit insurance companies. They have some more minor restrictions placed on them since the passing of the health care bill. But if you are over 25, you are not eligible for your parents' health care bill or a health care program, and you are legally mandated to have health care. Um, if you're poor enough, they'll give you some tax breaks for doing it. But otherwise, you are literally paid, you are forced to pay for a for-profit health insurance. When does that come into effect? Um, I, it's actually staggered. The mandate is one of the least, of the last things that goes into effect. I believe that's 2014. Um, but you should definitely check on that. So we're literally required to pay for a for-profit health insurance. Unions, before all this, fought and won health insurance. Health insurance that, yes, the workers still had to pay a premium for, um, but that the, uh, the employers matched. Uh, how many here have ever had a job? How many of you here have ever had a job where your um, employer pays matching health care? One. One person here. In the 1950s, almost everyone had it because almost everyone was unionized. These aren't abstract notions of worker power or worker solidarity or fighting back against capitalism. This is literally food, clothing, housing, and medicine. We can see, literally, from naked children mining coal from their bare hands to a comfortable, middle-class society of the 1950s that was fought for and won by unions. So, why do you need a union? Um, now, you might even say, I've run into this, you know, my, I've, I've literally had a lot of people say this to me. Well, I'm a student and I just have this job for a minute, you know, while I'm going to school, and I don't care about it. Uh, I'm rich, or my parents are rich, and I just, work this job, so I have extra money for uh, a car, or extra money for drugs, for both of those. 
Well, here's the thing. Even if you are not working that job for your livelihood, somebody is. And a union is one of those ways in which you can help make somebody else's life better. Because it is a collective organization and it gives collective benefits. So even if you personally do not benefit by a union, you can help another person by being part of a union. And again, it's worth noting, uh, I heard this also. You know, I, got, I get paid more now. There was a, uh, a construction welder. And he says, I get paid more now than I ever got paid under a union. That's true. And there's a reason why companies pay more to people who are not union. Because what's more dangerous to them than paying more up front is that their workers actually have a say in their job. And you'll look, who gets paid well in our society? Yeah, OK, there's the rich people. But like workers, mechanics, mechanics get paid well. Auto workers get paid well. Uh, depending on the freight line, sometimes truckers get paid well. Um, people in the movie industry, not just like people in the movie industry like stars, but like people working on the movie industry, they get paid well. Um, electricians, plumbers. Heavy equipment. Heavy equipment. equipment. There's something very similar about all of these. You know who doesn't get paid well? Retail. Who else? Most, most of the new IT workers. When it was new, yeah, OK, IT workers got paid well. They don't get paid well. Call uh, phone centers. They don't get paid well. All of these service workers, fast food workers, none of them get paid well. Something really interesting to keep in mind, all of these uh, trades that get paid well, they all historically have been unionized. Whereas all of the trades now, basically, that don't get paid well, they historically have not had a history of strong unions. So again, something to keep in mind. Okay, so we've gone through all that. Now the question is, what, how can I get a union? The United States is run, surprisingly, by the corporation and the rich. And it is a lie if anyone tells you it's easy to get a union. All the cards, especially in Utah, um, because we're a right to work state, all the cards are stacked against you. However, it is still legal to unionize. Um, I don't know if that's news, but I've heard from several people that it's not legal to unionize in the in Utah. That's not accurate. Basically, the process uh, goes through about four stages. The first stage is building the impulse towards a union. You want to do this completely underground. You do not want management finding out about this at all. What you do is you talk to your coworkers personally, one-on-one, -on -one, not at the workplace. Talk to them about what a union is, um, why they need to unionize, and help build their support for union. And it's not only enough to get them to abstractly support the union. You need to work to make sure that they are also willing to talk to people and you know, get a union going. So once you have your labor union or uh, your union leadership committee, which are the most active people who are willing to talk to people, to do house calls, to get phone numbers, to get work schedules, and to keep track of who's being unionized, who's pro-union, who's anti-union. Once you do that, you need to talk to a union organizer. So depending on what field you're in, there will be a union that traditionally organizes you. Now this isn't a hard and fast rule. A friend of mine was trying to organize a call center, and he kept trying to get the CWA, the Communication Workers of America, to send out an organizer. The CWA would not send out an organizer. So they went with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Now just so you know, the IBW is uh, usually the people who put the electrical wiring inside your, um, your house, but they've been known to unionize call centers. They've been uh, known to unionize uh, beauty salons. Um, so again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but you'll contact your organizer. And what they'll do is they'll set up a campaign for you, or with you, not for you. The union never does anything for you. It does something with you. So they'll set up a campaign. And the first step of that campaign is a union check card. Um, so while you're going through this legal process, there's also the fight to get your union recognized. A legal check card basically says, um, I want the union to represent me. So this goes back to the first idea. You know, not attempting to bargain by yourself, but attempting to bargain collectively. 
Now, as fun as it would be to have you know 500 people in a factory come into the boss's you know room office and yell at him what they want, that's just not practical. So what you do is you have a representative who is the union organizer, who is going to be that person that you talk to, all of you collectively talk to, agree with what you want, and they're going to be your voice. So the union check cards say, I want the IBEW, uh, the you know, uh, CWA, the, uh, or IOTC, or any other union. They say that I want them to represent me. Now, what, just practically speaking, you're going to want 80 to 70, or 70 to 80 percent signing this. But all you're legally required to have is 50 percent. This goes, once you have that, you, it goes into the recognition phase. So, what is the recognition phase? This is where the employer has to recognize the union. Now, if you're in a situation uh, where your employer is super nice um, and super friendly, or let's say you're on a university campus and you're going to organize, let's say, food workers or janitorial staff, and a student union on that campus has run a uh, fair play campaign and has put pressure on the administration, these employers might just accept the union and just say, okay, the check cards are enough. Um, it doesn't usually happen unless it's a high-speed industry uh, where any work stoppage is devastating, so like the movie industry. Or, again, if there is strong community pressure, like say from the students on campus, to make the administration accept those check cards, then employers do this. If they do it, then they've recognized the union and the union can go into contract mode. That will, by and large, almost never happen. Instead, what happens is the employer will say, no, I don't recognize the union. The employee check cards are not enough. We need to have an election. And it's a, a secret ballot election uh, held on the company property, um, ostensibly fairly, uh, where no one can you know, coerce people. But between the time they find out about the check cards to the time that they have the election, they can fire people. Uh, they can put up anti-union posters everywhere. They can um, force people into captive audiences where instead of working on the factory floor, you have to sit through a six-hour presentation on how the unions are evil and going to destroy the workplace. They will have one-on-one -on -one after one-on-one -on -one with every single employee. The employees that they think are soft on the union, uh, they will say things like, uh, you know, I, I didn't know it was so bad, you know, and I, I, is, if the unions, they can't actually promise you anything. It's illegal for them to promise anything. But what they can say is, you know, if, if the union gets involved, then there's nothing I can do. But, you know, if there's no union, then we can just talk as individuals. Because above all, you know, they want to be Mr. Nice Guy. If they don't like you, and they think that you are involved with the union, they will put you on the worst duties. They will change your schedule around to as bad as they could possibly get it. The only thing they can't legally do is fire you um, for unionizing. They will find any other reason. Your shirt was not buttoned right, or you had a smudge on your face, or you have a bad attitude, or you messed up something that you didn't actually mess up. They'll find another reason, and they will fire all sorts of people. Now, you might say, well, we have laws against this, and we do. If they fire you from your job for union organizing, you can appeal it. If you win, the only thing they have to do is pay a small fee and pay your back wages. That's it. So from the company's perspective, and you can see it time and time again, it's easier to fire all the employees you think are union organizing to scare the other ones and then pay back wages when they come back than it is to you know, actually have to you know, deal with the union. Uh, they can pull down the union materials. It's illegal for them to do so, but it's a small fine of a few hundred dollars, which is going to be nothing compared to what they'll have to pay if they pay fair wages. And that's it. Like all the anti union activities they do that are illegal.
have small, extraordinarily small fees, and they almost always get away with them. So it's based on the workers to continue fighting despite all of management's abuse. So let's say you go through all that, you finally win the election, or again, you know, you, they're for some reason nice, um, you know, you could get just a check card. Then you have to fight for contract. As a side note, to make sure this is not just about union, but also has a revolutionary theory, this also shows why you cannot trust either of the two capitalist parties either Republicans or Democrats, to support the working class. Every single Democratic candidate for the 2008 election, every single one of them said, without exception, they would pass EFCA. EFCA is the Employee Free Choice Act. What EFCA allows people to do is if, if 80% sign their union cards, then they can just recognize the union. Unless 30% of the workers, so not a majority, but if 30% of the workers want an election, then you have to go to an election. The only thing it did it, yeah, was two things. One is it made it so if a vast majority of workers just wanted a union, they would not have to undergo management harassment, and a small minority of just 30% could have called it to the election. So employ, uh, workers, you know, right to ballot, was still protected. And the second thing is it actually ramped up the fines for anti-union activity. Didn't add any more, add any more offenses, but rather increased the, uh, the fines for the offenses so it actually mattered. So pulling down uh, union posters that are legally posted was not a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, but was a ten thousand dollar fine to actually get people to not do it. Uh, so firing uh, an, a worker was, again, not just back wages, but thousands of dollars of fines. And that's it. That's all it did. Every single Democrat promised, promised they would get it passed. 2008, Barack Obama was the president. You had a Democratic majority in the Senate. You had the Democratic majority in the House of Representatives. EFCA was not even brought to the floor. It was not even brought to the floor. Who here has heard of the Employee Free Choice Act? Okay, how many people? You though. Right, and how many people have heard of the Employee Free Choice Act outside of the RSU? Two. And this was one of Obama's central, central campaign promises. You will never see the Employee Free Choice Act. Um, at least, at least not in the next ten years. So again, it's important to know, these sorts of victories are not going to come from the political parties. They are only going to come from workers who fight for them and win them. So you get your union recognized. You got your cards checked, and you got your election. The next thing you have to do is fight for a contract. Now, for any of you who are thinking of taking up the union struggle, I would encourage you to do so. There are all sorts of great ways to do it. Your first contract is going to be disappointing. I will tell you that up front. Your first contract is basically going to be exactly what you already have at your workplace. And the reason why is this. The contract is where you demand more. In that first contract, usually companies can say, well, we don't have money for it. And they do. Now, if they can't come to agree with the contract, then it goes to arbitration. So for example, if your first demands are exactly what you had outside of the union, and it goes to arbitration, then not only do they have to pay for arbitration, because federal arbitration, because they were the ones who weren't going with it, but they will, again, win, or you will win all the things you ask in your contract, because you're not asking, asking for anything new. And this will also go down as them being unwilling to negotiate the contract, which makes it easier in the future. Each time um, uh, the corporation, the workplace, doesn't or forces the contract to go to arbitration and they lose, every time that happens, it makes it more and more difficult for them to win arbitration in the future. Because 
immediately it looks to the arbitrator as though they are unreasonable and anti-worker. In addition, uh, when it goes to arbitration, they have to open their books up to the union and actually show how much money they're making. Um, has anyone here worked retail? Uh, did you work there with the scanner guns? Um, we had scanner guns, and it would show you the actual price of the product relative to the price that was sold. You literally had products that were being sold for $2.99 that cost $0.10, cents, 10 cents to, to purchase, and that included shipping. And so when they have to open their books, usually it looks really, really bad. The only reason the unions have been forced to take concessions, um, especially in like Detroit, is because the government there, and the government in general, including the Democrats, is incredibly anti-labor. Um, and just, just take GM, for example. Uh, GM was nationalized. Who was it turned over to? It was not turned over to the workers, who were then forced to buy a huge stock in it, and even further stock. It was turned right back over to the same people who had been running into the ground. So again, that first contract, you're just, the, the point is to get the contract itself. Then every time the contract comes up for negotiation, the union can ask for more. And it's a slow process, and it requires a lot of involvement. But more and more, uh, you can get fixed wage increases. You can get increased benefits, increased time off. And a lot of the reason why corporations offer those now is to attempt to keep a union from forming. So what is really unimpressive in the first two or three year, years in the union, in 10 years or 20 years, is a very well-funded, you know, good, good living wage with benefits. Now, if they don't do that, there are all sorts of union tactics. So that's the end of the contract. You get the contract. It can be for X or Y number of years. And then you collectively agree to that contract, and it applies to all the workers. Um, if they don't accept that, there are a whole host of actions you can take, including a slowdown, and including the most infamous of all labor uh, tactics, the strike. The strike is where all of you say, no more, this is unacceptable, and you stop working. Now, there are all kinds of strikes. There are sit-ins, there are slowdowns, uh, there's just a straight, you know, leaving. But, um, it's from the strike that the, the company now starts losing money because they can't continue operations. And they're either required to try and find other workers who will break your strike, that means cross over and work despite the fact that there's a picket line. And these are affectionately known as scabs. Um, or uh, they will essentially uh, have to cave to demands. Um, these are not necessarily revolutionary tactics. And in fact, uh, Hartley, or Taft Hartley uh, was passed in 1947, specifically outlaws the most radical of all strikes. There, there is, you are not allowed to have a general strike, uh, which is where all industries strike, and you are not allowed to have a sympathy strike. So if a factory is on strike and you're a teamster, you're not allowed to go on strike and refuse to carry stuff from that factory. They can do so illegally, which would be fine, um, but it just once again goes to show the anti-labor laws uh, here. But on that note, the only way that those labor laws are going to be repealed is if labor becomes militant again. If labor again starts fighting for its rights, for laws that begin to benefit it, and only when the bosses are more afraid of their workers, um, than they are of their shareholders, will you ever see any serious change in American labor? On the bright side, we're moving in that direction, and I hope this has been informative as an introduction uh, to unions for you. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Yeah? Question. Uh, so, do you go, is there anybody to go to when like, the union boss is in bed with the company boss, you know what I'm saying? Where, like, you have to join the union in order to actually work for the place, and you have to, like if you're unhappy with the union that's already there, for example, is there some other like national 
that actually helps out with that? Um, there's two things I would say. One course of action I would really not recommend. Uh, for most unions, um, there is an alternate union that you can use to bring in uh, to sort of split the union. Like for example, um, here we have UEA, right? Um, which is, uh, what is the, the union called? Uh, oh, United Education. United Education Association. Right. Utah uh, Education Association. There's like two teachers. Union. Right, and then there's also the American uh, AFT, or the ATF, the American Teachers Federation, right? So what you can do is you can bring in another union, um, and I really don't recommend that. That's your right to do so. What I actually would recommend is it's called rank and file militancy. So what it means is when they're when the union boss is just another boss and not a union representative, the rank and file can vote them out. Now here's the thing: if they're really in bed with the corporations, if they're really in bed with the company they will have a lot of protection. And in fact, um, the company will go out of their way to protect them. However, um, with enough organizing and effort inside the union, you can get rid of them. Teamsters 413 uh, out of Chicago has been fighting, um, I believe it's 413, I want to say. Teamsters 413 out of Chicago has been fighting organized crime elements and corrupt bosses for the last 10 years. And their candidates have won the last two elections and have them stolen from them uh, through basically underhanded deals by the union bosses and by the corporation, the company, uh, and by organized crime. And guess what? They still keep fighting and more and more every year, more people at that local are pissed off. And it becomes that much more difficult for the union bosses to turn them down and it becomes increasingly likely that the union will take actions that aren't sanctioned. Like you may have heard of a, has anyone heard the term wildcat strike? A, wild, a wildcat strike is where you go on strike without legal approval from your union. Striking is legal in the United States, but it requires the union approval. There have been many times, actually, I mean, not to undercut them too much, hopefully we'll work with them in the future. Uh, the Amalgamated Transit Union, uh, which is the union that covers UTA, their workers voted to strike, and the union leadership um, instead chose to negotiate. The only way to counteract that is to recognize the union is not there for you. The union is not your servant. The union is not your insurance company that when you have a bad day, you can grieve, that that's file, uh, a violation of contract, that you can grieve the corporation it's not a way that you can donate money to the Democrats or whatever local politicians that are going to support you. Um, it's not a way of having a union hall and a place to hold weddings and go drink beer. The union is its members. And when the members are not involved with the union, then it falls more and more on the leadership. But it becomes less and less leadership and more and more bureaucracy. So you need active, militant membership. And that is the best way to deal with a corrupt union boss. If they're really corrupt and not just you have a personal issue with them, then it's going to be really easy to point out that corruption. Really easy. And there's not enough, even the union bureaucrats, they don't get enough graft and kickbacks from the corporation that they can afford to buy off all the members of the I mean, if they got enough from the corporations to buy off all the members of the union, then they'd be doing their job in the first place. And so corrupt union leaders, people are going to be pissed about it. And all they need to do, well, not all, it's a big task. You need to make them aware that their voice can actually be heard and they can remove any corrupt union leadership. So unions are fundamentally different from corporations. If you've got a corrupt corporate head, good luck with that. They're going to probably, unless they do something absolutely outrageous, like Bernie Madoff, they're always going to have enough money to protect themselves and avoid lawsuits. Union heads, you get enough people at your union, man, they're gone. So that's what I would, I would say. Union, work and fire, file, militancy. And actually, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization uh, has a pamphlet called Creating a Fighting, uh, wor uh, fighting Workers Movement. And it actually talks about that. So you might want to check that out. Can you, as a member of the union, be, be removed from a union if 
you were trying to remove the head because you, you thought it were corrupt? Not really. I mean, there are ways you can be removed from the union, but basically, it's really difficult. Here's the thing. Unions are strong the more members they have, not the less, the fewer members they have. So actually, there have been laws passed to protect people, even people who are stabs. So you, if you cross that, they can't even remove you if you cross a picket line. And they, they certainly can't remove you if, they're, uh, if you're trying to get rid of the head. I mean, it may sound weird. Now, the union heads are in favor of you know, the corporations, or some of them, I don't want to say all of them. But back in the day, the union heads were the most violently anti-corporation. And so actually, companies would literally pay people to join the union to try and get them removed. So if you are trying to remove a, a union head, you have a lot of protection, legal protections. And if they're corrupt, they're going to come after you in whatever corrupt ways they can. But there's nothing legally or like in the actual organization you can do. And if they really are bad, you will have the protection of your union brothers and sisters that will keep you safe from them. Like, again, the, uh, the Teamsters, for, uh, 417, I believe, is in Chicago. Um, they've been fighting these union heads, and it's the Teamsters which is famous, I think unfairly, but famous for being corrupt. And they're still, they're still in it, and they're still fighting, and they'll still fight next year and the year after. So you, I mean, for us here, the big challenge is getting a union. For people like in Chicago or Wisconsin, the challenge is fighting not just you know, the corporations, but also getting good union members in as the head. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah. I want to share my experience, you know. I, I, you guys probably know Stouffer's, you know, over in Spirit. You know, Stouffer's part of the Nestle. You know, Nestle is one of the biggest corporations around the world. And I wore in Stouffer's a few years ago. I only wore there for a year and a few months. You know, and after applying there, you know, you just go to the basic training. And after that, you just get like a four hour lecture about why unions are bad, basically. And why, and why you shouldn't start a union in, in East office. Seems like a year after that, you know, I started working there, and a year after that, you know, I started like, me and another friend that work, and we started seeing like a lot of like shitty things happen, you know. So, we start talking, you know, we trying to create a union, you know, it was 10 of us, you know, start talking to the people, you know. And at the beginning, a lot of them were really receptive, you know, really like uh, trying to cooperate, you know, you know, trying to, to do their best, but I mean, you can imagine uh, the, the, the kind of obstacle that you you have to find, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible, you know. You know, first, in a bold way, I remember, you know, they, they contact us and one by one we went to like the president of Stouffer's office, you know, they, they offered me, you know, like a race, really good race, and chain of position, you know, something that I did not say, you know. Well, I, because no matter what, I have my morals to, you know, like, I don't want to tell you this, you know. We keep, like, trying to organize, you know, the people there. Um, you know, a lot of Mexican people used to work there during that time, and immigration law weren't that hard, you know. So a lot of them were, like, I presume, like, legal, you know, working here, you know. But, you know, you never know those things because they never tell you, you know, I mean, they, they, they have the right to, to keep that, like, private, you know. So when we start talking about the people, you know, like, uh, I remember a week after that, I started like saying like immigration is when I came here, you know. I want to start checking papers and all this stuff, you know. So we use, they start using different tactics, you know. Keep on, we keep doing the same thing, you know, trying to like uh, talk to the people and start like getting a lot of people in meetings, you know. But after that, I remember like a lot of the guys that were like working with me trying to create this union, you know, start getting fired, you know. Remember one day they called me to the, to the office of a supervisor, you know, and it was this girl that I talked to her like probably like a couple of times, and, and she accused me that I was like it was basically typical like, sexual harassment, you know, and I got fired. So it just we didn't even pass the, the the phase of organizing, you know, we didn't even pass that, you know, but it was so hard, you know, but, you know, but. Just I remember reading about about the unions and how it helped the people and the workers. You know, 
people need to realize that a lot of people died for this, for this thing. You know, a lot of people were incarcerated. You know, also, you know, and also the union as a tool to educate the worker. You know, it was, it, it was and still is a really powerful tool. You know, like a hundred, two hundred years ago, a lot of the workers were totally illiterate. You know, union gave them a sense of pride, a sense of like a, in a way, in a political way. You know, and you know they passed that that ideas to their kids, you know, their kids were like, the, the new generations, like educated, certain, you know, they went to college, they went to universities, you know, kind of like break that uh, circle of you know, being literary, you know. And even today, you know, a lot of, like, a lot of workers came from, uh, like, you know, lower, really low so kind of education, you know. Basically, they kill you guys before you can even start. Oh, yeah. We don't even pass the, that phase of organizing. But. Yeah, well, and there's there's three things to, to say to that. First is, um, I mean, this is why, again, with USJ, it's not exactly RSU, um, but, you know, we, we, we help out where we can. And this is why they have the, the slogan for May Day, which is legalize, organize, unionize. You know, if you have come from Mexico uh, without papers, you've probably paid a lot of money to do so, and it was very dangerous to do so. Yes. And if you are not legal in this country, getting raided by ICE is a real threat. And the corporations know that. That's why all the immigration reform is against the immigrants. It makes them easier to control. Because all they have to say, they start unionizing, uh, I don't know, I, I heard ICE is coming. Well, maybe ICE is coming. I don't know. Literally, the, the undocumented status of these workers is literally used. Literally used, consciously used to break up worker organization. And that's why they push it so hard. And that's why they get so much funding. Because they want the labor, but they don't want the problems that labor brings, like organization. So again, yeah, I understand. And that's something we should recognize. The, the struggle for immigrant rights is also a struggle for union rights. The second thing is the unions are the first, one of the first things to be attacked. In Colombia, uh, where there is a very reactionary government, um, a trade unionist is at least one murder every single week. Because the trade unions have been the core of workers' power. Um, they haven't necessarily done it perfectly. They haven't done it without mixed results or mixed characteristics. But literally, other countries know, especially fascist and corrupt countries, they know the first people you kill are the union heads. And you don't let any unions form. Um, and that's what they've been doing. And then the third thing is this. I know exactly what you're talking about. I tried to organize retail. I got, I, I got to the car check phase. So I, yeah, so I was moving, I was moving pretty fast. Um, but no, I, I hear it. That, Did you get fired? Uh, well, they basically, they, they, they pushed me to it was like either fire or quit. And at that time, the union had stalled, so I decided to quit to make sure that I passed my classes last semester because I wasn't, I was putting all my time into organizing instead of. But the thing, guys, that we started is like, see, we're fired for like, they went to manage positions, also realize what happened there, you know? Yeah, well, they weren't about to offer, <laughs> offer me management because they already knew I was pretty, uh, pretty hardcore. But yeah, no, um, I literally, I literally got employee of the week. Um, I got employee of the week because that's all they do. They do employee of the week. I got employee of the week three times, and literally the week before I uh, quit, um, I had. But two weeks before that, I had gotten employee of the week again. The next week after that, they brought me in and they're like, you know, we've had some complaints about your bad attitude, and uh, you know, you, if you don't, if you can't shape up your attitude, then maybe you should be working somewhere. And I had literally gotten employee of the week just right before that. So yeah, they'll do whatever they have to do to break the union. Um, but again, the point isn't to be demoralized. The point is to keep fighting and to keep organizing. So, yeah. I've heard that unions support lazy workers. What do you have to say about that? Uh, well, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't fire workers. It just means that you have an actual process. Like, we're a right to work in an at-will state. 
So what, what makes a lazy worker? Well, uh, let me, let me kind of tell you. Michael's and a lot of retail have this. You have a lunch. The lunch is federally mandated. They can't touch the lunch. Uh, but then they also give you breaks. And they give you breaks because they don't want the union coming. In fact, in, in their video, we all, I mean, if you've worked anywhere, probably you've seen an anti-union video. Uh, they're like, well, we don't need a union because we give you breaks, 15-minute breaks. And it, for any eight-hour shift, you get two 15-minute breaks. Well, here's the thing is they call you in and off those breaks all the time. When you first start, they don't. But after you've been working there a couple months, they'll call you off your break, and you're lucky to get that 15-minute break. Are those workers lazy? Well, maybe. Maybe not. But also, there's no process. Like, it's sort of like tenure, right? You hear this all the time. Tenure protects bad professors. If you're a bad enough professor, they won't protect you. If someone really wants to go after your job, they'll go after your job. Uh, not that I'm holding him up as anything, necessarily. Ward Churchill? Who's heard the name Ward Churchill? That's a pretty big name. Like, if you're doing anything with Native American studies, you're going to run across Ward Churchill. Colorado was able to ax him. Tenure, like the union contract, though, says you can't just ax somebody. You actually have to go through a process. So, this is the thing. How many, like, how many of you have worked at a job where you can get written up? Does that sound familiar? Okay, the reason why you have that is because of unions. And so the union, through its contract, can't protect a lazy worker. Like, they just can't. They can barely protect the hardworking workers. It just means that the company has to go through an actual process to fire them, instead of just being able to fire them straight up. But, and actually this is kind of bad, some unions don't argue for that in their contract. Like, there are some, and this is, again, part of the danger that's happened. People thought that they'd be able to always be employed and have that pressure, so they didn't fight for job protections in, in their contract. Um, you know, and now that it's the downturn in the economy, a lot of them are getting fired off and laid off, and they have no protections. So it's only what you can win in your contract, and you'd be hard-pressed to find any corporation that's going to sign any contract. Um, a, that they don't have to, and B, that protects lazy workers. Isn't that conflict with the at will policy that they have? You saw like this. Well, that's the thing is the contract supersedes it. That's why Utah can be so anti union. It's not, it's anti union because when unions get here, then it's at will and they can fire them. It's they can fire them the second there looks like anything like union organizing. They can blame it on something else and then kill those unions before they stop and start forming. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I think you should explain a little bit like what at will is here. Okay, so most of you who sign a contract with any um, place that you're working at, it says both your, empl your employment is at will, uh, both between you and whatever corporation, and either party can end employment at any time for any reason. Does this sound familiar to anyone who signed a contract? Okay, this makes it at will. Now, here's the thing. That contract that they make you sign does not supersede federal law and it does not supersede any binding legal contracts they have that would supersede it. So, they can fire you. They can't fire, they can, they literally said, they can fire you for any reason. Here's the thing, they can't fire you for being black. They can't fire you for being a woman. They can't fire you for union organizing. Why? Because those have legal protected status. And that federal protected status supersedes any contract they can force you or push you to sign. The union contract is the same thing. When you sign the union contract, when they sign a contract with the union, that union contract supersedes, insofar as you're a union or a member, or it's a union site, it's a union site is the more accurate one. That union contract supersedes all other previous agreements, legally speaking. So that's how you can get that, that contract and those protections. The second thing they use to help uh, break unions here is right to work stay. Who's heard of right to work stay? Okay. What that means is the union, if you are in a union shop, the union has to protect you. You have to get all the benefits of a union contract. Even if you're not a member. Even if you're not a member. And the union has to protect you. Um, depending on the field, you, the union might ha be allowed to charge you certain fees. For that, but they can't charge you for their political action fee. They can't charge you for the strike fund. They can't strike you or charge you for any union overhaul. 
or uh, upkeep, they can't charge you for any of that. They can only charge you the immediate single cost of whatever it takes to defend you. But again, they're required to do so. So again, the union, you have a bunch of essentially scabs. I call them scabs. People like to call themselves uh, contract workers. But you have a bunch of scabs who get all the benefits from the union and don't have to pay in one single, oftentimes a single dime. And so they just leave the union dry. They don't add anything. And so that way, when you know, the time comes to go on strike, there's not enough money to go around and they can't go on strike. And so that's another way that um, you know, Utah tax unions. Does that make sense? May I have a question? Sure. Could it be a comment of union kind of leaders? Uh, so they are leading those uh, union members and the state could protect union members. Uh, but sometimes uh, in Korea or in other countries, uh, those union leaders, they could uh, change their mind as to kind of, uh, uh, they did a big deal with the government or any other big companies boss, bosses as they try. So, those uh, union members, they could not easily protect themselves, uh, which means uh, to sometimes protect uh, those union members, uh, they need to a little bit uh, choose uh, good union leaders. Uh, so, kind of comment, yes, uh, to have any other comment or any other opinion about it. Yeah, and, and again, it's always vital. Yes. I, oh, sorry about that. Yes, because uh, Union leaders uh, generally uh, their duty is uh, protecting their union members, but sometimes uh, they could change their mind. Uh, so, um, so in, for example, in so on developed countries, sometimes uh, they try. So they could not easily protect themselves uh, because those union. A leader's mind sometimes a little bit different from union each members, which means that those union members they need to protect themselves sometimes. Yes. Yeah, and again, this goes back to union militancy. If the leadership is not uh, carrying out um, what the members want, genuinely want, then it's incumbent on the union members to fight and, as you said, protect themselves and not just expect the union to protect them. The point is like, a union can get corrupt, yeah, a political party can get corrupt, yes, you know, but the point is like, the union as like a, as a council, you know, it's like, a, I think it's one of the most important things that we have here to protect the worker, you know. Like, if you're a worker and you don't fulfill like the company expectations, you know, the company will use any excuse to fire you, you know. The company's gonna say that you are like lazy, you know, my big my, Maybe you are not lazy, maybe you are like physically ill or physical weak, you know, and you can you can work in, in the same at the same speed that the company wants for you to for you, you know. So what the with the unions, you know, those things couldn't happen, you know. With a union the company needs like a a big how can I say a really big uh leader. No, no, no. Company needs something like to prove why they're firing you, you know, something really strong, you know, against you to fire you, you know. So that's, that's one of the things the union, you know, the union protect the worker, you know, against yeah, that. They have to come up with a yeah. actual breach of contract between the union and, and, and the company, exactly. Right. And so they actually have to undergo an, an actual process rather than just firing you straight up. So, all right, any other questions, thoughts? Yes, I have a good yeah, I want more. Sure. Yes, in Korea, so generally, you know, public officers, uh, public officers, many other public servants, they wanted to make their own union, but uh, Korean government sometimes uh, they did against their trial, yes. because if they will make their own union. They will try to negotiate with government is to you know, raise up, raise up salary or other things, or they could control their working time. It's kind of teacher union is Korean. They have 
kind of teacher union. So those teachers made their own union. But those union leaders and those union members, between union members and government, so they did a little bit argued with each other because the government, they wanted to control those teachers' union. But government, they are giving them their salary and those teachers, all of teachers, they are consist of kind of a public kind of servant. So yes, that's why it became a big issue in Korea. And again, it, it's a big issue here, the Wisconsin um, strikes were based on teachers' unions. Yes. Any other thoughts, questions, objections? Hey, how about uh, we give uh, Greg a big hand? For the Also, if you're interested more in unions, uh, you can become an associated steelworker. It's illegal for unions to spend union dues uh, sending out information on unions. Uh, but if you're an associated steelworker, um, you are allowed to receive union information. So you should look at that. You can sign up. It's free. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to.